A good way to do lawn maintenance is to have some animals. So, since a few days, whenever it's possible, we open that gate and let the horses into the compound, because that way they will take care of all these plants, and especially there in the future dog enclosure and all around, without us spending gasoline or another fuel because they eat it and they will also manure and therefore fertilize it. So step by step, the soil in the compound will also improve. And the positive thing about the horses is they know where to step and they won't break anything because they're a lot more careful than, for example, the cows. While the horses graze in the compound, we keep the dogs in the enclosure. It's not because it were a problem, it's just that that way the grazing of the horses is a lot calmer. Initially, the dogs always try to chase them around or direct where they should be grazing. And after half an hour, this then calms down and then each one just goes a different way and everything is okay. But it makes it a lot easier and also our own traffic getting out and into the gate is easier when the dogs during the day are in their enclosure and not disturb anything. Because these guys are now guard dogs and they defend the territory and that includes anyone. So nobody gets in when they are roaming around. And here you can see a little bit of the maintenance work done by the horses. The grasses are now a lot shorter than they were in the beginning. And at the same time, this area becomes more and more fertile and more grasses emerge because of the positive influx of the manure. House manure is very good. Here and there I'm thinking maybe we should have horses instead of bovines because the positive effect on the soil. But then horses like to roam around. They eat here and there and then move and then eat a little bit. It's not like a cow. A cow eats whatever is in front of her and then moves on, while horses prefer to nibble a little bit and then move. So it's a totally different way. You can do rotational grazing with horses, but it's not the same thing. The old dog, Miriam, likes to roll around in the sun and just be happy and content. She's fat because she does nothing. <laughs> but for an old dog, that's just perfect. She has had a not so good life and now can enjoy her retirement, so to say. This is our experimental patch where we had Sunflowers, corn, some polovnia trees. Um, what else was in there? Sun hemp, of course. And then I cut it and let it rot. And this is now how it turns out after a lot of rain that fell down on it. This is dormant, but there is a lot of activity. Just when I stepped up here before I rolled the camera, a huge flock of birds were taking off. So they come here very, very frequently and hang out here because there is food, lots of insects. And that is um, a very positive thing. So when spring comes, we will plant new trees here, depending on how many have actually survived. But I guess the survivors are maybe three or four at most. But the idea is to have some polovnias growing here because this is supposed to provide shade to the house here. Of course, the house is temporary. Eventually, this house will not be here anymore. But for the time being, the trees should grow. And whatever structure we will put there, where the house is right now, this structure will then also enjoy the shade from the trees. So these trees that we will establish here, they are supposed to grow tall, have a canopy and 
um, provide shade because south is here to the left. The Tagasaste plant in there is alive, it's green, but it's not growing a lot because it's pretty cold at night. So the last few days we had negative temperatures at dawn. So this is not a favorable, a favorable environment for a lot of plants. But then during the day it heats up quite quickly and the difference is still between 15 or 20 between day and night. So if it's minus one in the very early morning and it heats up, it might easily end up at 18 degrees Celsius and in the sun it's a lot hotter. So right now while I'm filming I have the sun in my back and it definitely feels like uh, under a heat gun. And here in the shade of the house, these uh, plants always are a lot taller than elsewhere. And there's also a lot more moisture because every morning there is some frost or some thaw, some dew. And all that seems to be helping. And now I'm very thankful that the horses step by step um, pay attention to this area because they have grazed off in many other places already so that they will do, in the, main, they do with the maintenance here in this area as well. Yeah, just on the other side, basically to the left and behind me, um, you can see they have grazed this area very well. There's not much left. And also where the horses manure, they won't graze anymore. So those are the areas that they will then avoid and they won't come back until next year. Over there in our wannabe food forest, you can see that there's a lot of straw around the Capsicum annuum, the chilies, and that is to protect them a little bit and maybe they will come back when spring comes around. Um, this can be an annual plant when it's too cold in winter, or it can be a multi-year plant, depending on the environment. So we will see how this turns out. There's also a little bit of vetiver left. Um, whenever there's an opportunity, this gets cut and placed as mulch, like you can see here in that berm right next to it. And panning over to the other side, you can see there what shines a little bit golden in the sun. That is the vetiver that was cut here, so there, in this area, and then moved to protect the soil over there. It's supposed to rot and become soil, and whenever there is more vetiver, we will place it on top. Of course, it's not enough, because you can see the berm in the center is still empty, but it has a lot of other vegetation. But over time, the idea is to work with the vetiver and in spring we will plant more vetiver left and right of these bombs so that it's a chop and drop activity right there on site. Of course this is not the farm, this is just an experiment but it would be nice to make this an actual fruit forest by adding more plants, more trees not so much at the moment fruit trees, but more the support species. And the Paulovnias, you can't see them at the moment because um, they have lost their leaves. But there in the back, in this area, there are a lot of vetivers that have been growing just uh, a few months last year. They will come back in spring and uh, will then hopefully be a lot taller and soon they will be as tall is the oak tree that is sitting there. So this oak tree. This oak tree seemed dead, but it's not the case, it's coming back. And this is not Quercoselix, so it produces acorns, but they are bitter, while the oaks left to it and behind, all around, the dominant oak species here, Quercoselix, um, produces sweet acorns and they are sweet even for humans. So the pigs prefer them instead of those from the other one and if I'm not mistaken 
The other one is a Quercus suba. There are a few around, but it's not the dominant species. So those were a few impressions here from the compound. I will now take advantage of the clear sky and fly the drone, because we need a few aerial pictures for some planning purposes. And of course I will share them, because I'm going up to Zone C, and especially their CT1, where we want to start working now that it's going to be possible again. I have been climbing up to a certain altitude, as you can see almost 300 meters and there is a warning on the display which tells me that I am exceeding 120 meters, that is for restrictions and safety, there might be air traffic overhead, but in our case it doesn't really matter because the airspace overhead is class golf, which means it's completely uncontrolled, anyone can fly and that is usually an indication that there's hardly any air traffic around. So it is safe to do so. Mm -hmm. 